Okay, I think we're live. So, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to Tank Talk. My name's Anamika and I'm the editor here at Tank Storage Magazine. And today I'm joined by Richard Furka and Cesar Espinosa from the Rosen Group. Um, they're going to be talking about optimizing inspection coverage while reducing the risk of missing a critical flaw. So Cesar is going to start us off in just a moment. And at the end, we will have time for a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please put them in the questions box on the right hand side of your screen just there. Um, we've also got some polls coming up. So audience participation is very much encouraged. And when those go live, uh, please do just you know, answer the questions in the polls. There's only a couple of questions. Um, we'll collate all of the questions at the end and have our Q&A session then. So for now, Cesar, if you're ready, take it away. Absolutely. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Cesar Espinoza. I work for Rosen as a principal engineer in the Houston office. I am a basically head of the Department of Corrosion Growth Assessments and Facilities Engineering in the US. And I work also with Worldwide in Rosen to support many other businesses uh, and clients and projects. My main focus is on, as I mentioned, on corrosion and facilities engineering with a strong, strong background on risk-based inspection. So, well, thank you. Anamika for present for giving us that, that short introduction and a special thank you for allow us to or for the opportunity to present in, in this stage. So performing a, internal inspections on tanks is a fundamental portion or element of any integrity program. However, making the decision of when to inspect a tank, what will be the scope of work? What are the things that the technology or the accessibility requirements? All of these questions are very critical and most of the operators face huge challenge when they are prompted to, to plan their, their tanks and they, they, sorry, the internal inspections. So once that question is answered, then is the next step. I have to open that tank for internal inspection, but what do I need to do? What technology or what are the damages that I'm trying to look for or to find? What are the, the timing? Uh, is there a better timing? Do I have to do it now? So all these questions are critical. That's the topic of today. Uh, but before we hit the, the ground running, let's go over the content of the presentation. So first of all, we are going to provide a background, a historical background of all the evolution of the inspection methodologies on tanks inspection. Then we are going to see how this relate to the evolution of the risk-based inspection methodology and the concept of inspection effectiveness. We're going to tie back that to what the blind zone scanner is and how that helps uh, influencing the risk uh, scenarios and how also helps influencing the inspection scope and the effectiveness and optimization of the resources. Lastly, we're going to provide some typical methods that are applied to the, the blind sense scanner. scanner. Going to introduce some case studies and finally we'll conclude and of course open the floor for, for any questions uh, that you may have. So this is the historical challenges. So first of all, we have a, a, a series of facilities in the past that were, very, were fairly new for everybody in the world, in the industry. Nobody knew too much about it. There wasn't too much data collected. So we didn't know exactly what we were trying to do with here. We, were, we wanted to be safe, but at the same time, we were more probably focused on producing and getting a, our business in, a, in, the, in the best way possible. So essentially at that point back in the day, we were just in a approach of, well, I don't know what is going on. I hope it's good. Don't fix it until it's broken. Of course, that approach worked for a few decades until failures start to come and become an issue. We have unfortunate events that shape the industry in many ways. Then operators started to think that, okay, I cannot allow this to happen. Regulations start to, to, to become a predominant in the industry. 
So they said, let's do time-based intervals. Let's inspect this equipment the best that we can with all the technology that we had accessible at that time, and let's see what happens. The problem is that this approach worked fairly well for, I would say, a couple of decades, and then become unviable or unfeasible because of the you know, budget constraints and operators started to be under pressure or financial pressure to deliver a more, better margins to their businesses. And this is where API and all these inspection codes, not only for tanks, also for pressure vessels and piping and other components start to create. They incorporated another element into the equation, which is the condition base. It wasn't only time-based anymore. It is also condition-based. They introduced uh, things like a remain in life calculations, establishing trends, uh, corrosion rates, and, and things like that. And all of that just the purpose of you know, getting a much better idea of what it's going on with the equipment in terms of damage mechanism or damage state and have in a way a safe, but also a most, more optimized inspection scopes. What happened after that is that there was a realization, not only from the oil and gas industry, but for other industries as well, that the focus should be on equipment, on a certain small amount of equipment and not in the entire population. So the 80-20 rule came uh, prevalent in the risk scenario as well. So that means that you know the 80% of the total risk of a facility can be managed through only 20% uh, of the assets. And by focusing these inspections, you can even further uh, expand on the optimization efforts. The problem with this is, oh no, the problem will be more like a, the caveat on this is that risk, is strongly based on the understanding of the damage mechanisms. It's a foundational element of any risk-based inspection program. The better the damage mechanisms are understood, the trends, the morphologies, the locations, the better is the risk output, and therefore, the better is the, the inspection and, and maintenance strategy. So this is the evolution that we have today. And API 581 was released a couple of decades ago. It was, has been evolving. It has been collected data from the industry based on applications or implementations, and now is in a, in a position that uh, I will say that's probably my opinion that is in good shape to deliver very good results for for whomever is applying them. So one of the concepts that drives risk, and that's what ties everything into technology and NDE technology, is a concept of inspection effectiveness, which is the next. Uh, portion of a presentation. Uh, inspection effectiveness is a concept in API. There are other uh, methodologies that also use it, uh, probably with a different name, but essentially it's the same. Is the ability of an inspection to determine the true state of damage of a component or equipment with a high degree of confidence. So API 581 defined inspection effectiveness in five categories, each of them going through A, A through E, being A the most effective. That means that if you execute an inspection with a high effectiveness, you will be uh, determining the stage of the damage of the equipment with a 80 to 100% confidence. That's just an example. Doesn't mean that you will do 80 to 100% coverage of the surface area. That's probably a misconception in the industry, but basically what it means is that if you perform a highly effective inspection, you will certain about the condition of the equipment with an 80 to 100% confidence. So what are the elements of uh, inspection effectiveness? So there are basically three main things, which is inspection coverage, how much I inspect from the surface area that is exposed to the damage mechanism that plays a fundamental role. And we're gonna talk about that in, in a few minutes. The other thing that we, we have is the NDE method. What is the capability of that NDE method to target the detection of the damage mechanisms? And the fourth element that is not in one of these, uh, in this funnel, but is basically, I would say the whole thing that contains everything is the damage mechanism components. So an in inspection, sorry, for an inspection to be effective, it needs to target a damage mechanism. 
Why? Because based on that damage mechanism and the behavior of that damage mechanism, the morphology, I will select the right ND tool to detect that damage mechanism. So that success is just guarantee if those elements are uh, included. And the final element, which is more like associated to the all three, is the uncertainty. Uncertainty is pretty much the opposite of confidence into the damage state of the equipment. If I don't have a high effective inspection, I may may not very well what is the true state of the damage, or I may or may not know what are the morphologies or the locations that I need to, to focus my inspections. So uncertainty is critical element and inspection and is associated to inspection effectiveness directly. So the next few slides will touch on the uh, inspection effectiveness and what are the factors that influence the inspection effectiveness. As I mentioned, we have here four or five. In the funnel, there were only three, but there are two that are out of that. Uh, it doesn't, they don't apply in every region. So that's why it probably is like a talk separately or a separate items. So the number one, as I said, damage morphology, in my opinion, and the opinion of many, the success of any risk-based inspection program is the understanding of the damage mechanism the trends, the morphology, and the locations. With that in hand, we can have that understanding, but if we if we use the wrong ND technology, we will not succeed on determining the quality, sorry, the, the true state of damage of the equipment. Then, of course, who is doing that inspection? We may have the better technology, the equipment, but we don't have the examiner or the, the technician or the expert to run the inspections or manage the tools, data, what information are we collecting, where are we storing it, what, how we report it, and what do we do with it is what is important there. And of course, regulations and com company policies, sometimes they trump the, the inspections or the strategies, they are mandatory requirements that we have to comply with. We just need to make sure that whatever regulatory or compliance policy is in place, is good enough and satisfied all our inspection effectiveness. We can always do more, but not less. So make sure that the bare minimum is covered. So let's dive into, into each of those elements. So the first one will be the damage morphology that influences the inspection effective. So the way that we understand this is critical. For example, if we are having if we are having general thinning or uniform loss of thickness, the damage is widespread and very slowly in a, in a certain area. So I can basically inspect a much smaller area and have a wide understanding of what's going on in a much larger area. So in a scenario where you have general thinning, probably you don't need to go over and inspect the, the whole entire surface area. If you're certain about your general thinning, that's a damage mechanism, you can reduce your coverage and still achieve a high level of inspection effectiveness. If your damage mechanism manifests as a localized predictable, that means that localized, uh, the, or the corrosion anomalies are localized, they are not widespread, you still have not uniform corrosion, but you understand very well where they are located or they are clustered in a certain area you can spend a, a, expand the coverage a little less than a general thing, sorry, a little more, and a, have a understanding of what's going on in those areas, understand the type of morphology, the, the anomalies, a, dimensions, and things like that. However, if it is randomly localized, this is pretty much not much that we can do. We have to inspect more area because we don't know where the damage is located and there will be a certain amount of uncertainty that we have to deal with. This is probably where statistical approaches come handy and analyzing uh, data and trends. And of course, it will be strongly based on what is the data and the quality of the data that has been historically uh, gathered or collected uh, from previous inspections. I will say that those previous inspections have to be effective in order to, to be usable for a an, an statistical approach. So when it comes to the examiner's qualification, what I was saying before, we may have equipment, we may have the technology and accessibility and everything in place except a good examiner, the person that is taking the equipment 
and performing the scans or the, the examinations and reporting the data, analyzing the data, et cetera, et cetera. So POD or the probability of detection of any inspection is also related to the examiner's qualifications. So basically we have the person, the qualified personnel, we have tested them, we have endorsed their qualifications, we have, they have proven records of successful inspections or detection of failure or anomalies, great. Then we will guarantee that at least from the examiners or the people perspective, this inspection will not be unsuccessful. When I said geographical location, I didn't, I don't want to let that go away. Uh, basically what it means is that depending on where you are, the accessibility of uh, qualified examiners, uh, it may be a challenge. In certain regions, there are abundance of examiners with high qualifications. There are other regions that they are not qualified enough to perform this task. And therefore they have to either bring from other regions or assume or understand that the P of the of your inspection and therefore your effectiveness will be reduced and you have to account for that in your planning. Data, I cannot stress this more. The more data we have doesn't mean that the better, that is the better. We may have a huge amount of data that is useless. That sounds rough, but in many cases that's true. If we haven't targeting, we haven't targeted the damage mechanisms correctly or we haven't used the right uh, NDE tools. So the amount of data and the quality of the data is fundamental. If we can leverage historical data for our inspection dates, uh, inspection strategies nowadays, we'll have more chances of success. What happens if we don't have data now? Well, we have to start collecting it. We have to understand what are the damage mechanisms and then start collecting using the right NDEs and the right coverage problem. I have to uh, use a high coverage initially as a baseline and therefore, and then based on that confidence that I'm achieving with those inspections, start back, backing off on coverage and things like that. That's probably will give me the best uh, uh, balance between expenses and technology. This is the technology. This is probably the bridge that we are trying to build with all the technology uh, within Rosen. Understand what is the reason behind using all of this is not just using it for the sake of it. There are reasons behind all these technologies are in the market out there. And there is a reason why they are complemented with other technologies. They all encompassing a, a solution for, for the, the problem we have, which is determining how much and when inspections, at least for the tanks that are a critical por portion of the, of the operations, uh, we need to determine that. And we have to trust on the, on the technology that we use. Uh, trust and reliability how much we trust on that, what is the, the, the characteristics of the specification of that examination that we are getting. We are getting data that is accurate, what is tolerance, etc. Money matters. We Sometimes we may not need a very sophisticated tool, but sometimes we do. And if we do, let's make sure that we spend, we spend the, those, those dollars exactly where they need to be. So that's part of the inspection effectiveness. Value in your RBI system. If you are running on, on a risk approach, you may need to collect information that will uh, feed back into your RBI system. So make sure that the information that is collected is usable for you. And you guarantee that having an ID technology that supports your RBI program. Increase inspection coverage. That essentially means that you can, uh, depending on the technique and the accessibility and the uh, mobility of that tool, you can, move it around, collect a huge amount of data and information in a short period of time, optimizing uh, your uh, inspection uh, schedules and downtimes. Doesn't mean that I will not be covering the entire surface. I mean, I will, but in a short period of time, increasing the effectiveness. And coding on inspection, there are you know, many tanks floors or tanks in general are coded or have light internal liners that in, for some techniques, it may be a challenge to, to overcome. And therefore, technology also plays a fundamental role there if allows the, the technician to see through that or to go over coding without damaging it or the need to remove it. So all this flexibility 
is a fundamental in the ND technology selection. Next, I'm gonna transfer over to my colleague Richard. He will take it on from here to discuss about the blind zones and tank floor and how we leverage that for, for an RBI perspective. Thank you, Sidar. Yeah, good, good morning, good afternoon also from my side. Uh, my name is Richard Föcke. I'm working for the Development and Research Department of Rosen in Lingen, Germany. I'm working here since a little bit more than 10 years and I'm working as a, as a product manager for several product classes dealing with uh, tank inspections, cold tubing inspections, piping inspections and pressure vessel inspections. And uh, yeah, today uh, I will tell you a little bit about uh, blind zones. Yeah, what are blind zones in a tank? Uh, what are the typical methods and what solutions uh, do we have to uh, yeah, increase inspection effectiveness in the end? So Cesar talked already about uh, damage mechanisms and uh, on tank bottoms, yeah, we typically face corrosion. So the customer challenge is that, um, yeah, to, to find the corrosion, typically tank floor scanners are utilized that use MFL and eddy current technology. However, these floor scanners due to their physical design are not able to cover 100% of the tank bottom and um, they leave uninspected areas behind. Yeah, here in the end, uh, in, in the edges, yeah, marked with the, with the blue arrows, there are some, some uninspected areas due to the, the physical design of the tool. I will come to that in the next slide. And there are also obstacles in the tank, like pipes, like heating coils, like uh, supports, uh, where the tool cannot crawl under or around. So there's also un uninspected areas, which for example, are here marked in the middle. And these uninspected areas we call typically blind zones. Um, why can the, the typical tank floor scanner not cover 100% of the tank floor? Uh, here we have the example of the TBIL, the tank bottom inspection tool, what is also a Rosen developed tool. Um, but other floor scanners on the market have typically a similar design. Uh, so these uh, scanners have uh, some drive units, but as the tank bottoms are typically lab welded, so tank plates are welded on top of each other, and uh, the, the scanners cannot crawl over it, at least not when the, with the sensors touching uh, the wall or the bottom. The sensor line is typically in the middle because we have a magnetic yoke and the sensors needs, need to be between the north and the south pole and the distance of the, the sensor line to the area where the, the blades are overlapping is yeah, non-inspected. By, by utilizing the floor scanner in multiple directions, yeah, so we typically scan up stripes, but also right or left stripes, we, we minimize an uninspected area already. But uh, for, in this example for the T-bit, in each blade edge, we leave uh, an area of 245 by 245 millimeter uninspected. In case there's obstacles, there are obstacles, this uninspected area can be even bigger. They are marked in red here in the, in the right overview. And yeah, dependent on, on the shape and the size of the obstacle, also the non-inspected area increases. Um, why are blind zones or non-inspected areas relevant? Yeah, so we heard about inspection effectiveness and that the coverage plays a big role uh, to increase the inspection effectiveness. Yeah, so therefore we should try to increase also the in the, the coverage what we can cover with any NDE method. So we saw already that the application of floor scanners leave unexpected areas behind, but there could be corrosion present in these blind zones that is critical. Uh, so therefore the customer runs into a risk that a relevant metal loss indication is overlooked in a blind zone and of course, respectively also not repaired. So therefore there is a certain risk that can lead to an uncontrolled out of service, which we of course want to prevent. Yeah. Therefore, Rosen developed uh, a tool, which is called the blind zone scanner, uh, to improve this situation. So, but let's take a step back and let's have a look what NDT methods are applied today, typically to blind zones. Actually, there are more or less three 
technologies or methods. Uh, first of all, we have ultrasonic scanning using face array UT. This is a fairly accurate solution. So we can also cover quite a, quite a bunch or, or almost all of the surface, but it takes a lot of time to do this. Uh, so the operator has to be on his, on his knees and, and scan, the, scan the area. And furthermore, the tool is not really designed for tank floors. It, these tools are designed for different applications, which makes it also a little bit unhandy. Second, the manual ultrasonic inspection or scrubbing. Uh, there also you can, if, if you do it right, you can cover most of the surface. But here the examiner, as also mentioned by Caesar, comes into play. And so if you do that eight hours a day, you can imagine that, of course, reliability decreases and you don't get repeatable results. Uh, so here the human impact comes into play. Furthermore, the data is not stored. Uh, so those findings need to be uh, traced in, in, in documents or in, in software versions. But yeah, it's difficult to, to trace them back also after, uh, for example, 10 years, if you want to find these back for example for corrosion rate um, calculations a similar things applied for for visual inspection also that data needs to be integrated into any software or documented somewhere but here additionally uh, the disadvantage comes into play that visual inspection or the inspection or measurements with a pit meter only cover internal flows which means top side corrosion so Due to these limitations, we thought, hey, how can we overcome it and how can we optimize the inspection? And our blind zone scanner is specifically designed for the use in difficult to access areas. So the size of the tool is, is already fairly small and we can inspect a, a blind zone. Uh, and here we mean the typical blind zone in the plate edges in about one minute. Uh, so we've made an example here. So let's take a tank diameter of, let's say, 24 meter, which has a total surface of 452 square meters. We have a, a number of 243 blind zones and an expected amount of features based on the TBIT data of 104. Uh, we, in the bottom, compared just the time needed for the inspection here. So if you use an MFL detector, where there are also several on the market, which do not automatically size. So all indications have to be manually followed up. We would need about 12.8 hours for this inspection. Um, if we would use uh, face array UT scans, we would even more, would even need more time. So in total about 20 hours. Um, if we would use the blind zone scanner, we have two options. Uh, we can either use it with coordinates, which means we punch in the X and Y coordinate when we start a scan. It is automatically put into the, into the software at the right location. Uh, so you have to feed the software with a tank bottom drawing, but then uh, the, the data is put immediately at the right location. That would take us about 8.6 hours. If we would do it without coordinates, we would just uh, have a scanning time of 4.5 hours. But then, of course, we would have to manually implement indication into the software. With this solution, yeah, we can offer a, a most accurate corrosion mapping data. Uh, so the, the system itself spits out metal loss values, so feature depths, feature lengths, feature width, uh, the position of the indication, so if it's on the top side or on the bottom side, and it's automatically or can be automatically integrated into the software. So with this solution, yeah, we can reduce the out of service time because we are just quicker than other solutions and also the exposure of a human into, for example, a confined space, and there was reduce the HSE risks. Of course, um, the blind zone scanner also has physical limitations and leaves a blind zone behind, but we can reduce the blind zone from 245 by 245 to 120 by 120, and there was uh, reduce the risk of uh, missing a, a relevant metal loss floor by 75%. So let's talk a little bit about the scanner design. So it's a fairly simple design. We made it on purpose yeah, to, to reach this uh, difficult to reach areas. So we have the scanner itself that contains a magnetic yoke and the MFL and eddy current sensors. We have an electronic box that converts the data and a laptop that is uh, connected to the electronic box where the data is displayed online. 
So the tool is able to scan below obstacles. And the minimum spacing what we need is 150 millimeter. And as already mentioned, we have an automatic detection and sizing. So you can see on the fly when a defect is detected, what size it is and, and where it's located. Uh, we have a full capture and a storage of the high resolution mapping data. So actually we are using the same data or the same sensors even as on the T-bit, but just on a smaller device. Uh, so um, the, the indications you get, uh, the dimensions, you get the discrimination if it's on the top side or on the bottom side. And we additionally measure the lift off and based on the lift off, correct the, the metal loss sizing data uh, values. A data stitching, uh, so between TBIT data and blind zone scanner data is automatically done. So by the push of a, of a button, the, the data is merged and you can see uh, it in a combined overview. And yeah, with this, we, we generate a quite efficient and cost-effective solution, and which is also, of course, outperforming manual UT inspection. Um, small comparison of the technical performance of, of the TBIT and the blind zone scanner. As you can see in the details here, the performance of the TBIT is still better than the blind zone scanner. And that has also yeah, certain reasons. Uh, so we did the design on purpose. Also, the manually pushing of the device, the blind zone scanner is manually pushed also to increase uh, the, the inspection speed and being flexible. Uh, has also some downsides. Yeah, so we have a smaller magnet. So there was we can only cover plate thickness up to eight millimeter, where the TBIT can do 16. We can cope with coating thicknesses up to two millimeter for feature sizing, up to three for feature detection with the blind zone scanner, where the T-bit can go up to 16, uh, uh, sorry, six millimeter. And yeah, the detection threshold for the T-bit is a little bit lower with 10% metal loss, where the, the blind zone scanner has 20%. And the T-bit also detects a little bit smaller pinholes starting from two millimeter in diameter, where the blind zone scanner has a detection, detection threshold of three millimeter. In the end, both tools can discriminate between external and internal defects. So the amount of sensors of the tool is about one quarter for the blind zone scanner, but actually we are using the same sensor types, but just to the fact, due to the fact that the blind zone scanner is smaller, it has less channels. With the TBIT, we cover about 100 square meters per hour. And with the blind zone scanner, we cover a typical blind zone, this 10 inch by 10 inch or 245 by 245 in about a minute. So let's talk about a few cases. Um, here in, in the first case study, I have we have inspected a tank. I think it was also a 24, 25 meter tank in diameter. Um, we have the T-bit scan data on the left side. Uh, you see the different T-bit stripes, so the up and the right stripes, and the, the indications marked by the color. Uh, so here they are almost bluish, which is typically 20 to 40 percent. As soon as the defects become deeper, the color changes to, to red, uh, to yellow, and then to red. On the right side, you have the blind zone scanner scans, where you can see a lot smaller scans uh, due to the smaller tool size. And um, yeah, you see the typical stripes in the plate edges, yeah, so uh, which we cannot reach with the T-bit. We go with the blind zone scanner and cover that area. Or when there are certain obstacles, yeah, we also scan or cover that area with the blind zone scanner. How does it look when we combine the data? So in this overview, we have a combined overview of TBIT and the blind zone scanner stripes and, and findings. And this can be done just by the push of a button. Yeah, we just have to merge the data into each other. That is not a, not a big problem. Um, in this situation, we found 24 metal loss indication above the repair threshold in the blind zones, which would not have been detected uh, uh, by the TBIT. Both scans have been run or have run in parallel and have finished at the same time. And so right after that, the data could be merged and also evaluated automatically uh, in a combined evaluation. Um, relevant indications show up in a combined feature list. And based on that, also a combined repair plan can be uh, created. So we also have modules in the software for uh, repair plan creation according to API or EMUA. And yeah, there we also use, use both data as it is uh, available immediately. Based on the feature verifications, uh, we could confirm that we could hold the, the um, claim specifications. 
Um, we do do follow-up inspections uh, for a couple of or a handful of indications. Yeah, so there we we mark indications on the floor and follow them up if they're internally with a pit meter, if they're externally with UT, to just compensate for the situation that we calibrate our tools in the workshop of a certain amount of calibration plates, but the circumstances in the field are most of the time different. Yeah, you have different surface roughnesses, you have different material types, you have different cleanliness. So, and to cope with that, we calculate correction factors based on the follow-up measurements for internal and external indications, and that for sketch plates and annular plates to also compensate for different wall thicknesses. But these verification actually confirmed that uh, yeah, we could hold our specs. The second example, similar tank size, maybe a little bit smaller. We have again the T-bit bottom scan data on the left side. You can see already that there's a lot less indications found. And you have the blind zone scan on the right side. There's were at that time when we did the screenshot, there were a couple of plates not scanned, which are still shown up in, in, in white there. But also here you can see most of the, the scanned area were the blind zone in the edges, so there were not many obstacles. And if we combine this, the, the overview looks like this. Actually, in this case, we found zero metal loss indications above the repair threshold, but could confirm that there's no yeah, corrosion present in this blind zone, which blind zone, which is also a statement. Uh, so it's not, not always about finding indication. It's also about being sure that there's no indication in these inspected areas. For the rest, it was pretty similar. Uh, so we performed both scans in parallel. Data was stitched automatically by the merging function. And also here, the feature verification of the few indications we found there confirmed that the tool sized them fairly correctly. So let's, let's wrap up what we've just seen. Um, first of all, efficiency is key. Yeah? So in more and more uh, situations, or in almost every situation, uh, especially also for inspection, we want to be uh, efficient. Yeah? Cesar mentioned that also, when we spend dollars for inspection, we should spend them right. So when you use a blind zone scanner, you can have a fairly early tank closure because the solution is faster than other UT-based methods. Uh, so we don't talk about weeks that you can go back to service earlier, but you can win a couple of days maybe. We have a combined report functionality, so you reduce the human factor uh, by manually stitching efforts, but it's also fairly quickly by the push of the button, the stitching is done automatically. And in the end, the solution is also cheaper as less manpower is needed. Uh, so you don't need a man on his knees do UT scrubbing. You can just uh, have, a, have a service technician pushing the tool over the plates in, a, in an upside uh, uh, movement. Uh, so by this, uh, we can increase the safety by maximizing the coverage. Uh, so we could uh, increase the coverage of the whole tank bottom by a couple of percentage percentage in a, in a fairly cost effective way and with a high degree of automation, which is also important when we talk about um, compared to, to manual UT. And with this, actually, we could even eliminate the need for manual UT completely. Closing the loop to also to inspection effectiveness. Uh, so with the blind zone scanner, we can reduce the risk for uncontrolled service by, by minimizing the uninspected area. On the right side, you see an example of a, of a 24 meter tank. There, if we wouldn't have applied the blind zone scanner, the uninspected area was 3.2%. Uh, and by the application, we could even reduce that to 0.8%. So by this, uh, we can, can reduce the, the non-inspected area even further, although we cannot eliminate it completely. With the automation, which is integrated there, and automation, I mean mainly the algorithms that assess the data on the fly, we reduce the risks that the human is, is overlooking something, and we also increase, increase the repeatability. And last but not least, of course, saving time during evaluation. And in the end, of course, by the saving function and the data stitching function and having everything in a software solution, we also have an accurate data, which is also saved and can be reloaded also after a certain uh, period in time, which means 
Also for the next inspection, we can just reload the data, have a look, see where the critical areas were, and also compare data against each other. And all of this in the end increases the inspection effectiveness and reduces the risks to miss the critical four. So yeah, that was it from my side. Um, thanks for your attention. And I think the floor is open for the questions. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Richard and Cesar for your presentation. Um, before we go to the questions, I know some of you have been writing some questions in the uh, in, in that section. I'm just going to share the results of the polls that we did. Um, so, the first question the first question was: um, What level of inspection effectiveness do you currently pursue according to the API standard? And the most common answer was B, usually effective. So, 53% of people who answered um, answered B. Uh, the next most common was A, highly effective, and then we've got C, fairly effective, and D, fa uh, poorly effective. So no one, no one went for ineffective, which I think can only be a good thing. Um, and the second question was, what is preventing you from moving to a higher category? And the main thing is cost, which I think I'm sure you both probably could have guessed. 42% um, of people said cost. And then 19% of people across both of these actually uh, said internal standards and procedures and available technology. So I don't know if you guys wanted to talk about the polls a little bit sort of um, based on, on what people have said. Yeah, I can I can comment on the in both probably the inspection effectiveness being B, the most uh, the highest uh, poll numbers is is fairly reasonable and standard. I would say most of the operators that I've dealt with, they do sort of a B level inspection. Some cases they believe they have done an A inspection, but when they understand the reality of what's going on, they just realize like, oh no, that's actually more like a B or C instead. And this is when the decisions come into, let's better understand what the type of inspection and what we're trying to achieve with this inspection and then improve because in most, most of the cases, a, some inspections are performed like shooting in the dark pretty much, not, not quite understanding what, what's going on, what we're trying to detect and, and find. And once that realization becomes real, uh, this is where like, okay, we have we have to do something. And I think the second, not sure if you wanna say something to, to that Richard or add anything, okay. And the other question about the cost, I mean, the, what, what is preventing you to get a higher inspection effectiveness? That was the question, right? Uh, being cost also higher cost 53 percent makes perfect sense uh, these things are not cheap no, nobody whoever tells you that these inspections are cheap uh, is is probably lying uh, the access of this for this technology requires a, a good amount of expand however the benefits if they are well understood and they, there's good planning the benefits are probably more on the on the mid to long run you put some money up front right now, you'll get data, you'll understand what's going on. And then in the future, you may back off on some coverage or some technology because you have achieved a level of understanding and confidence of, of what's going on. You have established sound corrosion rates and things like that. And so therefore, back uh, later in the future is when you can you know, see the benefits uh, of optimizing this cost. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Cesar. Um, so we're going to go for the go to the questions now. So there's quite there's quite a few. Um, this first one comes from Michael. Uh, he says, "Is the BZ, is the BZS providing remaining wall thickness in millimeters or percentage material loss, as we know from the T bit?" Yeah, maybe I can I can answer that question. So actually, uh, it's pretty much the same as for the T-bit. It's a completely the same data format. We're using the same sensors. So therefore, also the result is completely the same. Uh, so the blind zone scanner spits out percentage wall loss. Uh, 
as well as the length and the width of the feature in millimeter. And it tells you also if it's on the top side or the bottom side of the plate. Uh, so we can, based on that, calculate also the remaining wall thickness in millimeter, but the standard delivery is actually the percentage of wall loss. Okay, brilliant. Hopefully that answers the question there. Um, the next one is from Chloe, and she says, what is the positioning accuracy of the presented solution? Actually, yeah, we're talking here about a couple of or a few centimeters. Uh, so there is a, a, a bit of inaccuracy which we get from the tank bottom drawing. So before we start the inspection, we measure each plate, the length and the width. We give it a number uh, to also then in the end make the reference to the stripes that we scan. And based on the measurement of the plate length and width, there's a little bit of inaccuracy which we expect of a, a centimeter or two. And then there's a little bit of inaccuracy also from the driving. Uh, so sometimes you drive not 100% straight with, with the tool. But um, yeah, we talk about like uh, two to three centimeters where we are typically in the area, which is also should be sufficient as uh, patches uh, which are made for repair are typically bigger. And that's also what the API requires. And Cyan is asking, is it possible to operate multiple tools simultaneously inside a tank? Yes, definitely. Uh, so as, as you saw in the presentation also, it's, it's not a problem to operate the blind zone scanner and the T-bit in parallel, but we could also, of course, if we talk about bigger tanks, like 80 meters, uh, we could run two T-bits, two blind zone scanners in parallel, and in the end, we can just merge the data uh, by pressing a button and then we have a combined data set which we can ut utilize further for making repair plans or further detailed data assessment, but it's definitely possible to operate to simultaneously in, in the same tank. Okay, brilliant. Um, okay, Hervé is asking, is it possible to do an inspection with paint or with insulation? So I think with insulation I, I think it or paint is meaning coating if i understand this correctly so actually yeah we have we can do inspection on coatings and coated tanks with the blind zone scanner i think i mentioned that briefly we can do feature sizing so the determination of the the length width and depth of the features up to two millimeter of coating thickness uh, up to three millimeter we can do a feature detection so until then we can say there is something or there's nothing as soon as, as it becomes bigger, uh, we would have to test it out. But typically, three millimeter is, is the limit for the blind zone scanner. For the T-bit, we can go a little bit higher, up to six millimeter for feature sizing and up to 10 for detection. But as we have a, a little bit weaker magnetic yoke in the blind zone scanner, there, three millimeter is the limit. OK, real. Um, so Sega is asking, uh, it says, the, the blind zone in a tank is placed under the shell to the bottom plate plate joints. So what are the options available for inspecting that? Uh, actually, actually, we are not with, with these two or this solution presented, we are not covering the area under the plate shell. Uh, I, I know that this is, of course, a critical critical area uh, with, with, with that also uh, shows certain uh, damage mechanisms, also mainly corrosion. But there are typically other methods I use, like um, face to AUT, because we are shooting into a, a not directly accessible area. We also did some trials already with different methods, like the MMN method, which showed also fairly promising results. But um, I think there's up to no uh, limited tools they are using that technology. And um, yeah, there's a, a few solutions available, but um, and they're not that matured, I would say, yet. Mm -hmm. Not quite ready for the market yet. Yeah. OK. Uh, Molly asks, how is the BZS tool powered? Mm -hmm. How is the tool powered? Yeah. Now, actually, um, yeah, we use, we use uh, small uh, lithium batteries, uh, so we don't have a, a big power cord to the device. We, the, the, the device is a complete mobile device. Uh, also, the battery contains sufficient power to run a, an eight-hour shift. You actually, can even run it with this battery a couple of days. 
And uh, yeah, with this, we guarantee that we have a, a mobile solution and we always all ship uh, a charger with the device so that we can charge uh, the batteries up on site if required. Okay, brilliant. So I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, so someone's asked the calculated data, uh, how long is that stored for, just in case I need to use it for future reference? Mm -hmm. yeah, so actually, we, we, we hand over the, the report. Uh, so either in a written format or with our uh, software called Rosoft. Um, if mm -hmm. the, the software can be installed in a, in, in a client computer and clients can open the data, have a look at, at the, the color scan and have a look at the location of the indication and can make their own repair plans. So there it's up to the customer how long he stores the data. But we also, of course, internally store the raw data for minimum 10 years, uh, I guess even longer. Uh, but um, yeah, I think we can, can meanwhile even, so we do this business since more than 20 years and we have thousands of inspection uh, performed. And I think uh, also data older than 10 years can, can still be recovered. Brilliant. Um, is the blind zone scanner examiner qualified to API 653 Annex G? That's, that's a fairly good question. Uh, so actually the examiner itself, we have a, our internal training program. Uh, it is, it is in line with ASNT TC1A. Uh, so our operators have to run through a, a dedicated theoretical and practical training. Uh, so it takes uh, six months to a year until we have a qualified operator and uh, the tool itself yeah so the the, the blind zone scanner as well as the t-bit comply with the requirements of the annex g uh, so we, we calibrate the tools on uh, a certain amount of indication a certain defect population and wall thicknesses so actually yes yeah so the tool itself complies with annex g and also the examiner is qualified to according to, to the asne asnt tc1a okay brilliant um we've got one follow-up question from sega asking about uh whether you can share the options for that um bottom plate inspection uh, what is uh so just as can you share the options oh, sure. available? Sure. So um, this is of course yeah we have we have the blind zone scanner we have uh, the the T-bit and uh, there's some supplementary services we can of course offer. Uh, so uh, in the end we can perform a complete API 653 or a MUA 159. So there the the bottom scan is only part of. But um, yeah, also for the bottom scan, yeah, we, we have the, the different options which we can certainly share. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Um, I think that is all the questions that we've got. So, um, is there anything you guys want to add just to wrap up your your presentation? No, I think from my end is leverage technology in the best way that you can there of course there's a cost component but let's all keep in mind that the more um, higher quality of data that we collect the better decisions we will be able to make in the short term if we don't have data right now that is representative it is a good time to start collecting the data so we can see benefits really soon yeah no, nothing to add from my side. So, yeah, if you have any further questions, you know where to find us. Mm -hmm. And uh, Absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Richard and Cesar. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for Tank Talk. Um, that's, that's it from us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.